Alright, how's everybody doing there? Today is day 201, 365 days towards racial change. I don't know if you hear the thunder, we're having some badly needed rain right now. Actually, we're going through an interesting time here this summer. There's a heat dome over a portion of the uh, United States, uh, looked like the Ohio Valley area. Uh, so they're going through it. Uh, I'm at a higher elevation. We're getting some rain. We're in the state. I'm in a state with perpetual drought. We need the water. <laughs> this is day 201. I'm Tomlin's Nyback, 365 days towards racial change and uh, moving right along. Oh, God darn it. I wanted to have a little celebration on day 200, but that's okay. But we're doing an extended version of Uncle Tom's Cabin in light of me going on vacation, and I like to do it. You know, maybe, maybe we'll call it like a summer break, uh, but still committed to giving you a daily dose of racial change. We're here talking about black issues in America. What you know, where we're situated, how we live, well, you know, our thinking, all that. How black people are getting along starting to get interesting feedback. I get consistent feedback from my mom. Thank you, mom. <laughs> but I'm getting other feedback from subscribers, having an interesting oh, debates and, you know, challenge my thinking, challenge their thinking. I appreciate all of it. Uh, just know that I'm a person that believes racism is very relevant, very much alive. We, we've, we're seeing it come in some very overt elements lately that's disturbing. These elements are the kind of elements that were the precursor to history's, some of history's most brutal episodes of domination and overwhelming uh, uh, another group, you know, we're especially talking about the Jewish Holocaust, but even the uh, uh, Americans, America's slavery over hundreds of years, you know, just the way we dehumanize and we can't you know, just like the Jews, you know, every once in a while they'll come out with a good movie or a good documentary to keep us remembering, you know, to keep us focused. Because these things, these things aren't going to go away in my lifetime, you know. Be, be nice, come back in a millennia or so and come back to Earth and say, boy, th this place used to be very racist, and this people thought they were better than that people, and this people enslaved them, and stuff. Wouldn't that be nice to have that in the distant past? But it doesn't. It doesn't go away until we get out of get out of the way of the denial of it, and all that, you know. So um, I'm very much not in favor of those who say that slavery is ended, we're in a new era, and, and all this crazy, foolish talk, when you, all you got to do is turn on CNN and see what the, the head man of the world is saying, you know, you know, I'm even, I look, look at my speech, I'm even endorsing this guy as the guy of the world, right, oh my goodness, we've really fallen into it, if we can start thinking that. This is the most powerful man in the world. There's then there's no limit. So it's in our speech and our language. I, there's I, I went to a class, philosophy class that talked about that, the importance, impact of rhetoric. Uh, so that's it, you know. So, and what's the mind of Black Americans? And I'm talking those descended from slaves, American-born, you know. <clears throat> Those with that direct roots, we need to overcome. We need to educate ourselves. We need to be honest. Uh, we need to know when 
racism is coming at us. The problem is, is with racism is like uh, we, it's hard to prove unless somebody is uh, some absolute bigoted supremacist and say, yeah, I, I was down on that black person for that. You know, uh, hard and impo uh, nearly impossible to prove without disclosure um, from the offending party. You know, you know, I, I'm starting to <laughs> rethink this thing. You know, if I'm in a room, um, with eight guys, eight white guys, and I'm the only black guy, and there's a apple pie with eight slices on the table, and they just, you know, we're allowed to get this pie. If, I'm, if I don't get a piece of pie, as, as that a racist scenario, you know, all the white guys got a piece of pie, but I did not, right? So, so I'm not saying it is racist, but am I allowed to think that? Am I allowed to be, be honest about what's going on, you know? And, and the things we've talked about through this year up to this point, you know, racism can come. Let's just say, you know, racism, it touches everything in American life. America made itself that way. Right? There's, you're going to be hard pressed to find space in America where racism is not an issue. Consequently, you know, for the, you know, uh, you know, for the white mind, uh, what about how it thinks and behaves? What, what is, what is the agenda of the white mind in America? You know, is it honest about uh, preferences, privilege, favoritism? The, the, does the white mind have any consciousness about how it moves around the world with such ease and influence? These, you know, kind of like uh, colonizing here or there, you know, politics here and there, you know, where we're whipping up some issues now again in the Middle East, keep messing with the oil, you know, messing with bombs and stuff. So, you know, the white mind, you know, yeah, are there any filters on it? Any restraints? Right? I mean, this is the mind that instituted slavery on steroids in the world. American slavery is like no other slavery around anywhere at any time in the world. Right. I mean, slavery is brutal anywhere, but you know, America made it a business, an institution, uh, a, a, uh, a scenario with no way out, absolute domination into perpetuity. And, and it's, it's dying hard, very hard. And financial literacy among black folks. You know, I was explaining uh, quite well. I'm, I'm reading a book called Creature from Jekyll Island. I'm starting to get my head around some concepts. Biggest concept, the theme. Let me say it. Let me just try this. Hope maybe I'm saying it right. It's fractional reserve banking or fractional reserve lending where... Uh, this is a, this I never knew, uh, but I'm getting a real education where uh, you know, I get a paycheck. Say I get a hundred dollars, that hundred dollars gets uh, deposited in the bank. The bank immediately takes oh upwards of ninety percent of that money and loans it to other people and other banks. You know because the bank knows that there's a 
very low proper probability that I'm going to come and get that hundred dollars immediately. You know, I'm going to it's going to sit there, and I'm going to buy coffee and you know chips over here and stuff, but never a hundred dollars at once. And so this is the mind. Uh, so it takes that money and lends it out to people, and, and then when the two things happen, the lent money that becomes a kind of currency, um, and if the money is lent to other banks, they take upwards of 90%, and it, and it snowballs bank to bank to bank, people to people, and uh, the problem comes when if people come and want to, you know, liquidate, you know, if too many people want to come and liquidate, then, they're, then the bank, the bank doesn't have the, the raw money, you know, you say the bank, bank says, well, we've got a million dollars, well, it doesn't have a million dollars, it's got maybe a hundred thousand to cover any cash withdrawals for that day. But that uh, other nine hundred thousand dollars is out in cyberspace. It's lent out. It's gone. And you know, even even like you know, if your bank account is considerable or large or something like that, they want to give and you want to liquidate. You got to give them notice because they they got to scramble. It takes them two or three days to get that together, right? Uh, I'm doing that with one of my other kind of savings accounts, you know. It does, it's not an immediate withdrawal. So, but financial literacy, understanding it. And this is the way the world, this is the way finances work in America. And it's, it's a locked in system that will never resolve itself. To resolve itself is to mean the, it means the entire collapse of the financial system of the world. So you like national debt, and I, I always scratch my head about the national debt and the deficits or uh, all that trillions and billions and quadrillions of dollars that keeps ticking up every day. And it's like, well, let's just pay it off or whatever. Well, you can't pay it off because it, to pay it off, is, it means a stagnation of the system and it means a collapse of financial life around the globe. That's that's some of the things you want to understand about financial literacy. Uh, understand debt is good if used rightly and wisely. Um, debt is capital. So those some of those things start start to get your head around that. Just just you know take take ten minutes, fifteen minutes a day. Just learn something new about finances. You'll be you'll be amazed at what they're doing with your money. And it's, it's interesting how tough it is when you need a loan and stuff like that. Also read a book called Creature from Jekyll Island. I'm inspired by a man named Dr. Claude Anderson. Uh, I read a black history reader. Hundred one questions you never thought to ask. Black labor, white wealth, search for power and economic justice. And Dr. Anderson's national plan to empower black America. Powernomics, you can find Dr. Anderson at powernomics.com. Behind me, you'll see the hashtag us two symbol. That's uh, black women coming together, supporting one another. It's a reaction, in a sense, in some ways, to that hashtag Me Too movement. Check out Black Enough, B L A G G E N U F, uh, for uh, some experience and networking there. If you can't find your flavor on the web, do what I did start your own blog, blog log and uh, get the word out there. I got a private email list. I'm glad to have you on it if you're not. And uh, we'll go from there. And finally, we're doing an extended version, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And um, doing that for a couple of reasons. I'm going on vacation and stuff, but uh, it's just an easier I mean, pretty easy to, to get some information out. Uh, but the Uncle Tom's Cabin, we look at this fictional life because it illustrates 
uh, you know, slave life in America. It gives us a lot of talking points. Uh, Jim Crow, maybe we'll talk about today. Meritorious manumission. Some pretty heavy topics come out of this book. Blackface, theater, uh, Shirley Temple, Bill Bojangles Johnson, and the, this, this dynamic older black man, little white girl, and things. Uh, well, you, you know, there was a time when that was a okay <laughs> um, scenario uh, that that got tainted in America. Um, so yeah, so it's a very important part, um, book, and we're going to get into that uh, more today. We had an introduction of it uh, yesterday, today to. Uh, Day 201, I uh, will talk more about Topsy and uh, her introduction to Ophelia. St. Clair, he's just bought Topsy, and he, he references, he brought her from uh, Jim Crow line. She was uh, apparently entertaining. She was for sale, and um, <laughs> she's singing, and she's doing a song and dance, and St. Clair loves it. And th this is uh, something we saw at the, in the opening chapter of the book at uh, the Shelby plantation with little Harry. You know, uh, Shelby kind of whistles or snaps his fingers and he calls him this little um, you know, mulatto boy. And the, Harry does a little song and dance. And uh, at the end of it, his, he gets paid as piece of orange or apple and it gets sent out and uh, at that moment Harry becomes incredibly valuable you know same thing happened here with Topsy and uh, you know we talked about this. I have you you may guess I have some misgivings about black folks entertaining all the time but what you know you need to be taken seriously well, and at my job, you know, uh, it, was, it was nice if I'm smiling and joking and playing all the time. But you know, when I when it comes when I got to put my foot down and talk about a serious issue, boy, uh, th does management scatter, and suddenly it's it's like I, I I'm like a terrorist in the space, <laughs> you know. Um, I'm, a, I'm a threat. And it's challenging. And nobody's talking to me. And so, you know, the, the work, the workplace not isn't hostile. It's the nature of uh, high volume logistics. Uh, my job's secure, and the relationships are mending and stuff after just little experience. But uh, it's. Uh, it's interesting. I'm learning a lot. I, it's it was very. This is a valuable experience. I wonder how long I've been avoiding this because you know, I'm not. I'm not a guy to take a stand, be out there and stuff until you really put me in a corner. Uh, this came about uh, in a, an apparently a benign situation, and uh, so we're, we're just. I'm wading through it and watching seeing how it goes you know so so this is the second time in uh uncle tom's cabin where we have you know black folks entertaining white folks and their their value goes up and all that but you know uh, black folks have more value than entertainment you know i know it's what Gets us millions and billions of dollars. Michael Jackson, Jay Z, uh, everybody, and all this, all this glitz and glam and, and, and stuff. But I'm an entertainer too. I play guitar. I, I'll give you a good show. But um, you know, fine. We, we got to have some depth of value more than uh, to, this entertaining all the time. So Sinclair, he, he brings Topsy to Ophelia and stuff. Now, Ophelia has just gotten into her routine. 
the house is adjusting uh, to her presence, her authority, and things like that. And uh, she's finally in routine, and now St. Clair brings a little black girl uh, to be mentored and instructed by Ophelia. Ophelia's understandably like, man, you got to be kidding me. I, you know. And she complains. She's like, look, the house is is already like some kind of shelter, you know, rescuing all these black folks, you know, almost like a Schindler's List. If you ever watched that movie, that's, uh, you know, uh, Schindler, Jewish, no, I'm sorry, he was a Jewish uh, German guy, an industrialist, you know, uh, you know, a company, company owner, profit and stuff like that, but something was in his heart and he started rescuing these Jewish people to work in his factories and all that, you know. Uh, you know, and it was life or death that for the Jews if they couldn't get into to working for him, Auschwitz and stuff like that. So uh, he, he had that mission and great movie. I love the movie. Um, Liam Nielsen is uh, the, the star in that, but it good movie. So that's kind of St. Clair's plantation, kind of a Schindler's List for black folks. Uh, you know, and, and at the time, you know, I'm guessing he's not the only plantation owner that recognized the humanity of uh, black people. Um, we, we talked about Prue's murder. You know, Prue's murder can come about. Well, she got she's owned by ignorant white people, but her owners uh, don't recognize, don't respect Prue's humanity. So it makes her it makes it easier to kill the thing, like stepping on a roach or something like that. Saint Clair, we know his history. He he was very close to his mother, and she was very much into. The, the humanity of people. So you know, we're not we're not surprised that he's he buys black folks occasionally uh, as kind of a rescue and stuff. Now, uh, so now Topsy is going to be the ward of Ophelia. Ophelia's like I got enough to do already, but now Saint Clair he brings up some of the arguments, some of the philosophical things that were very uh, pronounced in chapter 19 where he talks about the hidden racism in the north versus the overt racism in the south and so he, he puts it he puts it squarely on affiliation he, he's like look you got your abolitionist uh thoughts you got your religion up north and all that uh but you know let's let's bring some black people into the house into intimate relations, <clears throat> you know, two important things like, you know, a, a Topsy is the victim of the system, pure victim. She's a blank slate, no etiquette, no manners, all that. Uh, you know, she performs, mimics, copies, the, no, no thinking, no original thought. And uh, she's a product of the system, you know. And then the, on the other side, um, Ophelia with the, you know, abolitionist uh, favors and religion on her side and all that, you know. You know, let, let's put some skin in the game, Miss Ophelia. You know, I'm I'm in a, a city that's uh, being gentrified. You know, it's being conformed. To, to our present day middle class ideas. And the consequence of that is it moves black people and poor people out of the space. But uh, so like so I share sometimes I walk to work on some evenings because of transportation issues. And uh, there's a sign in the front yards, black people mattered. But um, it's in a, a white gentrified neighborhood. You know, so I, I kind of shake my head. I don't, I don't 
have any evidence for what I'm about to say. But I wonder how much that sign means for you know for how close those people are. You know, so only one sign on in the neighborhood are the people there presumably white. I've never seen them. Uh, are they th that close to black people where they can have a sign on their lawn? And do they have black people flying in and out of their space at will? I wonder. I really wonder. Um, so that's Ophelia. You know, St. Clair puts that challenge to Ophelia. You know, are you really this? And he can, he can say that because he has the argument. He's running the shelter. He's running a rescue mission. He's doing all he can short of freeing all the slaves. Uh, he lets them, you know, experience free, their idea of freedom sequestered on that plantation. They're safe there. It's a safer space. It's not some brutal, barbaric. There, there's uh, demands and challenges, but it, you know, he knows it could be worse. Cruz murder is evidence of that. You know, so he, he can, he, uh, you know, let's let's give St. Clair, yeah, he's a slave owner and all that, but let's give him a little bit of kudos because he, he's not some harsh, hard drinking, uh, undisciplined, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> If you're black, you could really fall into the wrong hands in that time. Man, it can really get bad. We're going to, I'm not going to be a spoiler, but we're going to, we're, we have yet to see. We're only halfway through the book. Let's see what's coming up. So, but St. Clair's like, look, you know, let's put some skin in the game. You know, and you know, okay, you're settled in. You got the house in order and under control. Now we need to take it up a notch. Uh, you know, let's get into closer proximity, experience some intimacy with a black child with no training. And, and you know, and uh, she goes, Topsy's like, <laughs> we're going to see this. There's an interview coming up. But not much of a spoiler alert. <sighs> Topsy doesn't know her how old she is. She doesn't know her birthday. She doesn't know where she was born. She doesn't know where her parents are. You know, she, 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 she's a product of the human puppy mill. You know, she was born when weaned off to uh, the market she went. <laughs> you know, and um, that's it. And no nurturing, caring, training, you know, now, now she is a slave. She has, she knows a few duties, um, but you know, just very mechanical. No, 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 um, no idea of who she is. No identity. No self identity. You know, here's some of the things um, when this, when the book came out, the story. And well, what happens with any kind of theater and art is it informed, that narrative informs music and plays and stuff like that. A song came out of this um, uh, back in 1852, written by Eliza Cook, appearing in uh, uh, Frederick Douglass' paper. Uh, 1852, and, and the song, it was very popular in Britain and America at the time. And in the song, uh, uh, this is the song that Topsy's going to sing for St. Clair and Ophelia because St. Clair just wants to snap up some entertainment like he's put a coin in the jukebox. In the song, in Topsy's song, when she's doing a song and dance, she talks about being wicked, uh, she's no good. A uh, white man has the, the right to, to have slaves. Uh, she, she's in nigger skin, she refers to herself. Uh, you know, 
<laughs> not a very encouraging song that uh, Topsy is sharing there, you know. So, you know, that's a flavor of th this new new dimension in the Harriet Beecher Stowe's book, you know, uh, Northern Northern racism, hypocritical attitudes being exposed and challenged, and its first uh, challenge is this blank slate black child, female black child. Uh, so you know how, what, what's going to happen, <laughs> right? You know the, these people are just thrown into this experience together. Uh, St. Clair is making demands, Ophelia is objecting, but, but she acquiesces. So she says, okay, I'll take on this challenge, this little black child. And Ophelia is a person of, you know, her character is, you know, she likes to finish what she starts. She, she likes success, she likes to win. Uh, that's the flavor I get. Uh, as I go through the text. Uh, so uh, she's not taking this commitment lightly. Um, she's burning her ships. She's going through this. She's determined, dedicated. Topsy has no idea what to expect. She, Topsy doesn't care. This is just white people doing stuff, whip me, slap me around, order me, whatever. You know, sing and dance. You know, she. There's no sense of self of who she is, what she should be doing, and all that. That's that's how she finds herself. So let's let's see how these relationships progress as time goes along. I'm Thomas Nyback, out of time. Uh, day 201 in the bag. 365 days towards racial change. Let's. Stay tuned and keep up the pace. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.